Mount Everest. Remote, treacherous, and with barely enough oxygen to survive. A century ago, no one had reached the summit. This is what they came to see. This is what they came to climb. The highest mountain in the world, it was there to be explored and hopefully there for the taking. In this program, Mount Everest summiteers reveal how the mountain was conquered. In a hundred years, we discovered where it was, how high it was, what to climb it with, the clothing, the oxygen, everything. From staying alive in the death zone... Dan should definitely be dead. ...to beating some of the world's worst weather. Brave pathfinders risked everything. George Mallory's body was lying spread-eagled in the scree. Now, hundreds of people stand on the summit every year. OK, I'm going to have to be quick, because it's actually quite chilly. I'm standing on Everest, by the way. From tragedy to triumph, and from base camp to the top of the world, this is Mount Everest, then and now. The Himalayas stretch 1,500 miles through northern Asia. This cold white world is home to the planet's tallest peaks. Here, one mountain is king, Mount Everest. When you get out there, you don't realize just how enormous this thing is. Everest is a monster. At 8,848 meters, it stands five and a half miles above the sea. It's a hulking mass. It really is head and shoulders above every mountain around it. And now, thousands of people have managed to achieve their dream of climbing to the summit. But in the early 20th century, Mount Everest was an alien world, completely unexplored, until British mountaineers stepped bravely into the unknown. When I was 12, I met this cousin we called Uncle Hunch, and he told me about this huge mountain. This is Howard Somerville, a remarkable man. He's a double first at Cambridge. He was a surgeon, a musician, a painter. Uncle Hunch was also a climber. In 1924, aged 34, he joined one of the first British expeditions to Mount Everest. They really didn't know where the mountain was. It was somewhere on the border between Nepal and Tibet. In fact, the summit of Mount Everest sits exactly on the border between the two countries. The mountain has two main routes to the summit along the southeast ridge from Nepal and the north ridge from Tibet. In 1924, Uncle Hunch and the British expedition trekked 200 miles through Tibet and approached Mount Everest from the north. They had hoped for a, an easy snow slope. Instead, they saw a giant three-sided pyramid, uh, a rock and ice monster. Uncle Hunch and the rest of the climbers were used to European mountains, half the height of Everest. For those first climbers, Everest was a new world. They're in a very exotic uh, and unhealthy country. Half of them were suffering from dysentery. Uh, they got frostbite. It was a very, very tough mountain to crack for those pioneers. After weeks of climbing, Uncle Hunch entered Mount Everest's death zone. It's an area of the mountain higher than 8,000 meters. They call it the death zone because people die simply because they are too high. Because there's not enough oxygen to 
sustain life. When you get to Everest Base Camp, there's only about half the oxygen available that there is at sea level. And by the time you get to the summit, there's only a third the oxygen levels that there are at sea level. And, and those levels we know are absolutely at the limits of what human beings can tolerate. One of the reasons that we went to Everest was to explore what that level was. In 2007, Professor Mike Grocott wanted to know the effect of the lack of oxygen on the body. So Mount Everest became his laboratory. Mike's team measured oxygen levels at various heights. Here, at 6,400 meters, three quarters of the way up. So we've, um, we've just analyzed Dan's arterial gas sample and it, it's just astonishingly low. You should be worried. <laughs> still alive. <laughs> still alive. <laughs> But the ultimate aim was for the team to take blood samples in the death zone. At an altitude of 8,382 meters, and with their oxygen masks removed, the climbers were breathing some of the thinnest air in the world. And there in a small shelter, four of us uh, took arterial blood gas samples. The color is blue, Come in. it's very dark. Arterial blood coming from the heart is usually bright red. The uncharacteristic color could only mean one thing, severe oxygen depletion. Whoa. PO2, 3.50. Dan should definitely be dead. The measurements we made of uh, oxygen uh, in arterial blood were really extraordinary. There's no accounts of people with that sort of level of oxygen in the blood who aren't unconscious or uh, immediately after cardiac arrest. The death zone's atmosphere is so dangerously thin, now most climbers carry extra oxygen to help them survive. We are there as visitors for a very short period of time, and most of us can't really go there without some form of supplementary oxygen. But back in the 1920s, many mountaineers dismissed the need to carry extra oxygen. It was almost viewed as not cricket. You know, it, it's slightly cheating, almost a, a, a drug-assisted ascent. In 1924, Howard Somerville had climbed to 8,570 metres. He dreamed of being the first man to summit Everest, but he had to make it up the treacherous North Ridge in the freezing wind. The technical area on the north side is when you've got the first step, second step, and the third step. You're in a high altitude environment on tricky technical terrain, so it's, it's not to be underestimated. 300 meters from the summit, Somerville was forced to turn back. When coming down, his uh, larynx became frostbitten and uh, the mucous membrane sloughed off, blocked his airway, and he sat down to die. And he told me how he sat down and did a Heimlich maneuver, squeezed his chest and coughed up this frozen um, mucous membrane. Uncle Hunch was able to breathe the icy air and staggered on down the, the mountain to the North Pole. There he met his friend George Mallory. George Mallory was a passionate mountaineer who had tried to summit Everest twice before. Now, on this expedition, he was determined to succeed. His name will forever be connected with Everest. A uh, very strong temperament, a very driven individual. Mallory came up with um, his rucksack full of oxygen cylinders, ready to have an attempt with the, the magic gas, oxygen. After Somerville's failed attempt to summit, Mallory saw an opportunity to make history. Mallory said to him, Somerville, I've forgotten my camera. Can I borrow yours? And uh, Howard Somerville unwisely, he told me, lent George Mallory his, his camera and watched him as he headed up the mountain. And that was the last he ever saw of him. Mallory and his climbing partner, Sandy Irvin, were last seen just 250 meters from the summit, before the peak was shrouded in thick cloud. So George Mallory, Sandy Irvin, did they summit? Uh, who knows? 
Howard Somerville had given Graham a tantalizing opportunity to solve the greatest mystery of the world's greatest mountain. He said to me, age 12, if you could go and find that camera, you could prove whether my friend climbed it or not. Was there a picture on that camera of George Mallory standing on the summit, waving his ice axe? Who knows? Next. George Mallory's body was lying spread-eagled in the scree. Was Mallory the first person to reach the summit? And climbing Everest from the south, then... A nightmare of spikes and chasms, a wrinkled and ravaged face. And now... Fifty million years ago, Mount Everest was born. The Indian subcontinent collided with Eurasia, forcing land upwards and creating the Himalayas. For millennia, the summit of Mount Everest was uncharted territory. But in March 1924, George Mallory and Sandy Irvin embarked on a historic mission to be the first people to summit the mountain. Mallory was carrying a camera given to him by Graham Hoyland's cousin, Howard Somerville. I became really obsessed by trying to find this camera, get the picture developed, and prove that Mallory had actually climbed the mountain first. Graham began by retracing Mallory's steps. So, Here's the border between Tibet and Nepal. Here's Mount Everest, the actual summit. And Mallory would have come from their base camp up here, from the north, through Tibet, around up to here to the North Col, up the ridge, and certainly got to this point, just a few hundred yards, really, from the summit. To this day, the outcome of Mallory and Irvin's push to the summit is still disputed. I think quite strongly, if I had to put money on it, that Mallory made it to the summit. I just can't imagine him turning around short of the summit, even in the worst weather, if there was any chance in his mind that he thought he could get there. Like Mallory decades earlier, in 1993, Graham climbed into Mount Everest's death zone. I'm a very average climber, and as I chopped up those last few steps up to the summit, I thought, you know, if I can do this, surely George Mallory climbed Mount Everest. Graham became the 15th Brit to reach Everest's peak. And at that point, I thought he must have done it, and I, I set out wanting to prove that he had done it. When Graham returned to Everest in 1999, there was a startling discovery. George Mallory's body was lying spread-eagled in the scree. It had been attacked, unfortunately, by birds, but in his pockets were a bunch of strange things like nail scissors and a bill from his tailor. But the one thing that there wasn't was a camera. And so I started putting together what we knew. And uh, there was one crucial clue that came up later, which was the weather. Mallory and Irvin were last sighted just 250 metres from the summit before they disappeared into a cloud. Howard Somerville had taken readings down at base camp of the air pressure, and these were eventually were unearthed at the Royal Geographic Society. Somerville's record of the weather was fine still morning, clouds began to advance up valley, clouds behind and on Everest from 11 o'clock onwards. We realised that George Mallory and Sandy Irvin had been climbing up into a perfect storm. When I put the clues together, the low pressure, the, the perfect storm, the limited oxygen, the poor clothing and, and the lateness of the day, I realised that uh, Mallory probably hadn't climbed to the summit. It doesn't take anything away from their immense achievement. Uh, this is the way humanity learns things. 
by pioneers risking their lives. For decades, every attempt to reach the peak failed. Mount Everest seemed taller than ever. St. Paul's is 365 feet high, one fourteenth part of a mile. The highest mountain in the British Isles is Ben Nevis. The highest mountain in Europe is Mont Blanc. The highest mountain in the world is five and a half miles high. After the Second World War, Nepal opened its borders to foreigners. The 1950s offered an opportunity to plot an entirely new route to the summit. From the south, the scale of Everest is so huge, it's easier to think of it in three sections. The first section starts at base camp, rises up the Khumbu Glacier and into the Western Kim. The second section rises sharply up the Lhotse face and ends on the South Col. Then the third section, from the South Col, up the knife ridge and onto the summit. In 1953, the most famous expedition in mountaineering history started its trek from the south through Nepal. The team included a Kiwi called Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, a Sherpa. After weeks in the foothills, the British-led expedition team laid eyes on the mountain for the first time. So this is it. This is what they came to see. This is what they came to climb. That spring, they established a base camp. Now, every year at the same spot, base camp is home to dozens of tents from across the globe. Here, climbers prepare for the ultimate adventure. The first challenge is one of the most treacherous stretches of the mountain the Kumbu Icefall. This advance party must advance through a frozen but burning forest. A forest as haunted by danger as any jungle in the world. A nightmare of spikes and chasms. A wrinkled and ravaged face, but a face that is always changing. For the ice is always on the move. Cracking, rumbling, roaring. The icefall is basically a 2,000 foot cliff with a glacier falling over it. There's giant ice chunks the size of a tower block constantly moving. It's a really frightening place. You, you climb up through these moving blocks, up some ladders tied together across huge crevasses. The ice has got to be made as safe as possible, though safe up here remains a comparative word. One year, an avalanche came down and nearly killed me and Brian Blessed. The Kumbu Icefall is very technical and it changes almost on a daily basis. And you need to really have an awareness of your surroundings to be able to negotiate that safely. Well, we're crossing a ladder and I'm punching in the background. Whew. It's not about moving quickly. Do you want me to pull the ropes for you? Okay. It's about moving safely through an ever-changing environment. <laughs> you think so? You think I'm going to enjoy it here? <laughs> going over the chasm of death. As well as negotiating ladders over deep crevasses, climbers have to gently ease their way over snow bridges. It's difficult to know with some of these snow bridges, which is the strong part. And where to stand, and where to stop, <laughs> and where not to stop. And that's a classic where you can see that, you know, where you put your left foot, eventually that might get compromised. So, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a slack rope. Oop, uh. 
1953, the mountaineers hoping to be the first to summit Mount Everest had successfully navigated the icefall. Next, they had to trek up the Western Coombe, a vast flat area of endless snow and deep crevasses, only to be confronted by a giant ice wall, the Lhotse face. It's a 1,200 meter wall of blue glacial ice that rises at severe angles of up to 45 degrees. The climbers spent nine exhausting days carving out a route up this icy face. Hillary and Tenzing partnered up into one of the assault teams. They would now be climbing so dangerously high, they had to use supplementary oxygen. The 1953 expedition was based on months of painstaking research and preparation. Some climbers acted as human guinea pigs in decompression chambers to replicate the severe lack of oxygen. His oxygen mask is off. The air is getting thinner and thinner. At such heights when you're lacking oxygen, you may think you're normal, but you're not. You're moving in a dream, a dream that deludes and debilitates. Pew is now, as it were, at the very summit of Everest. He's approaching unconsciousness. The modern oxygen system is delivered through a very uh, low volume mask. In the old days, there was the Russian fighter pilot, the old MiG mask, and it was a big Womble mask. And these days, this is a very close fitting mask uh, from the uh, Tornado pilots, actually. Unfortunately, you do lose a little bit of the ability to uh, talk. Even now, supplementary oxygen is still a limited resource. If it runs out, then very quickly your body will deteriorate and uh, acute maxi sickness will be uh, quickly followed by life-threatening situations in a very challenging environment. It, you don't want to be incapacitated above 8,000 metres. At 8,000 metres lies the South Col. It's a pass between Mount Everest and the fourth highest mountain in the world, Lhotse. The South Col is the highest camp on the mountain. It's a final opportunity to rest and recuperate before the assault on the summit. The South Col, Camp 8, 26,000 feet. A very hard place to get to and a very hard place to live in. higher you have a feeling of extreme vulnerability you are two or three days away from help and assistance in a high altitude remote environment uh, psychologically that can really get to people the south col is no place for thought most of the time on the col a man hardly thinks at all when he does he usually thinks what bliss it would be to get down again you need to make sure that you don't just lie down and go to sleep because you need fluid. You need to get a, a, a drink on the go because if you get dehydrated, you're much less likely to summit. So you need to busy yourself in the tent and get on some energy. The final push to the summit starts in the dead of night. At 8,000 meters, climbers are at the mercy of the weather. Making a decision to go for it is the difference between life and death. It can take up to 16 hours to reach the peak. So climbers need to ensure they have enough time to return safely. The South Col takes away everything. It also takes away his sleep, unless he's using oxygen. Worst of all, it takes away his judgment. Hillary and Tensing will need all their judgment tomorrow when they set out up that ridge, if the storm subsides. So why didn't we go to the summit last night? <laughs> uh, we arrived in a storm. We, uh -huh. sat, we sat a storm out uh -huh. the entire night. Yeah, massive gusts and uh, snow coming in the tent. Yep. Snow like and wind blowing in the porch. So we couldn't melt water. Uh -huh. Did you get any sleep? 
I think I got about five, ten minutes at one stage, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, right, yeah, so yeah. that's very generous. What time is it now? 11.50? 11.50. And when are we hopefully off into the night? About 9.30 tonight, so yeah. we've got about nine hours to just chill, rehydrate, eat. And play cards. And play cards. Oh, Yana. we didn't bring the cards. Oh. We had a lot of fun. You know, you're living at 8,000 metres. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Let me see. Oh! He drops it. <laughs> I think that sense of camaraderie was probably quite important in, in the 20s and the 50s. Yes, you've got those people with quite big egos who want to be the first, but at the same time, you're all working for the greater good. By 11 a.m. on May 29th, 1953, Hillary and Tenzing had begun their final push to be the first to reach the summit and were already out of sight. Everyone's thoughts are on what is happening on that knife-like ridge running up to the summit. But the climb today is beyond the reach of human eye, almost beyond imagination. A hundred meters from the summit, Hillary and Tenzing were confronted by Mount Everest's final obstacle, the knife ridge. It's a dangerous section of steep, sharp, exposed rock with perilous drops of more than 2,000 meters on either side. Well, I cut round the back of one ridge and round the back of another ridge, and the summit never seemed to be coming any closer. And, but finally, I cut round the back of another one and saw that the ridge ahead dropped steeply away. So I looked up, and there was a little rounded cone above us, and I knew it was the summit. All that was needed was a few more blows of the ice axe, and Hillary and Tenzing would be the first people to stand on the summit of Mount Everest. Okay, I'm going to have to be quick, because it's actually quite chilly. I'm standing on Everest, by the way. This is the peak of Mount Everest. At 8,848 metres, it's the highest place on the planet. As Hillary and Tenzing celebrated in Nepal, the news reached London on a very historic day. June the 2nd, 1953. People in London were excited, and with good reason. A queen had been crowned. And to add to the cheers, the newspapers gave an extra of extras. Men had climbed Mount Everest. Britain as a whole was absolutely delighted. As a nation, we have always had an adventurous spirit. You know, we've explored the world all over. But I think that lure of the highest mountain in the world, it was there to be explored and there for the taking. Next, after the triumph, then the tragedy now. The deadliest day in Mount Everest's history. It was just utter, utter destruction. The foothills of Mount Everest are home to the Sherpa people. For generations, Sherpas had little contact with the outside world. As Buddhists, they believed a goddess lived in the mountain. Not wanting to disturb her, many did not set foot on Mount Everest. Then, there was no Sherpa word for summit. But now, climbers call their Sherpa porters and guides kings of the mountain. They have been an absolutely integral part of climbing on Everest from the very beginning. You can see that they're faster and stronger at altitude than certainly I am and most Westerners. But little is known about their apparent superhuman physiology. We're starting to see evidence that their genetics have altered through evolution, that they are naturally adapted to perform well at high altitude where there's not much oxygen. In 2013, Professor Mike Grocott's Extreme Everest team returned to the mountain. 
On their first expedition in 2007, they had already witnessed the superhuman Sherpas in action. We couldn't have done the expedition without the Sherpas. They were climbing alongside us, but carrying substantially larger loads and apparently effortlessly. So it was great to be able to come back in 2013 and, and really try and answer from a scientific perspective why that was. At a height of 5,300 meters, Mike's team built the world's highest laboratory to compare Sherpas to lowlanders. Bite on the mouthpiece, that's perfect. How's your breathing? There's some striking differences that start to explain why they perform so much better at high altitude. Da, 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 da. Keep us in. The Sherpa's physiology is suited to producing the energy to power their bodies, even when oxygen is scarce. In a Sherpa's muscles, the parts of their cells that generate energy are more efficient at using oxygen. And at high altitude, whilst lowlanders' blood flow slowed down, the Sherpa's circulation was less affected. Extreme Everest uh, was uh, almost entirely comprised of doctors and scientists, uh, many of them who had a background in uh, critical care, intensive care, so looking after the sickest patients in, in a hospital. Lack of oxygen in the bloodstream is a major contributor to deaths in intensive care patients. As a critical care expert, Mike is hoping the Sherpa's superhuman ability to adapt to altitude could have benefits far beyond the slopes of Everest. The real uh, joy and challenge of the next few years is, is looking at the huge set of data that we've accumulated and trying to work out from those what it is that identifies the people who've adapted well. And if we could get our patients to do that, then maybe, uh, if you like, we can turn them into Sherpas. Now, the superhuman Sherpas are the backbone of every successful expedition up Mount Everest. In the old days, I think people were probably a bit more purist and they would probably be carrying their own gear. And nowadays, tents are set up for us by the Sherpas. Some people have all their gear taken up to Camp 2. And you see people actually, without even carrying a rucksack on the mountain, a Sherpa in front of them with their every need. Sherpas prepare the mountain by setting ropes, anchors and ladder bridges and they use their expert knowledge of its twists and turns to help guide climbers to the top. I couldn't possibly have climbed Everest without them, you know, I mean, quite seriously, without Ang Sain Kami Cherry, not in a million years. In 1993, Rebecca Stevens became the first British woman to climb the world's highest mountain. It was a tremendous feeling of, of togetherness. I mean, I remember it, you know, until I breathed my last breath. That year, the Nepalese and Chinese authorities had begun to increase the number of climbing permits. I think through the 90s and into the 21st century, we are now in the commercial era on, on Everest. In the 1970s, just 562 people climbed Mount Everest. Over the last decade, nearly 4,000 people have reached the summit. Nepal is a, a poor country and it desperately needs foreign exchange. So it has to try and make money out of the Himalayas, and in particular Mount Everest, which is a real cash cow. So to climb Mount Everest would typically cost anything from uh, 35,000 US dollars all the way through to 120,000 US dollars or, or more. Throughout the 21st century, climbing Mount Everest allowed the Sherpa people to flourish. Now, the climbing industry is worth over one and a half billion pounds to Nepal every year. But Sherpa livelihoods and lives are at the mercy of the mountain. On April 18th, 2014, Warm weather triggered a series of avalanches near Mount Everest's icefall. The icefall is a very dangerous part of Mount Everest. And whereas we Westerners might only go through it two or three times, the Sherpas have to carry the uh, tents and equipment and food and everything through dozens of times. Sixteen Sherpas lost their lives. 
And when 16 die in one event, for the sake of looking after Westerners on the hill, I think it, it, it struck a, a very uncomfortable chord about the dangers that they were being exposed to. During the 20th century, brave Sherpas were at the heart of Mount Everest's success story. Now, there was a grim realization that being a mountaineering Sherpa was one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. On April 25th, 2015, a huge earthquake hit Nepal. It's one of the worst natural disasters in the country's history. Tim Mosdale was one of hundreds of climbers on Mount Everest when the earthquake struck. We arrived at Camp 1 and we radioed down to base camp and we heard that, you know, the middle of base camp had been obliterated. Oh, oh. The earthquake had also triggered avalanches on Mount Everest. One of them swept down the mountain and thundered towards base camp. <laughs> 359 people were waiting to climb the mountain. When you're at the base camp, you think of Everest as being safe, um, but the forward draft from the avalanche just swept through the camp, you know, rocks flying everywhere. And if you were in its path, you know, that was it. It was just utter, utter destruction. Nearly 9,000 people died across Nepal. At base camp, 19 climbers lost their lives. Three of them were Sherpas on Tim's expedition. They left behind nine kids and they were working on the mountain to provide for their families. The 25th of April, 2015, is the deadliest day in Mount Everest's history. People were questioning really what was going on and was Everest really... A century ago, the summit of Mount Everest was an unknown wilderness, untouched by human hand. Now, the highest point on the planet has been transformed into a tourist trap. On May 22, 2019, this photograph revealed the reality of climbing the mountain waiting for hours in a queue. Too many people stood for too long in a very challenging environment. That picture was taken on one day and it will be like that on one day in 365. For the rest of the year, one of the elements can make a summit impossible, wind. At 8,848 meters, the summit of Mount Everest is exposed to the extremes of Earth's weather. At the top of the world, the wind is wild. So it being nearly 9,000 metres, Everest pokes up into the jet stream, which is a force unto itself. Freezing winds batter Mount Everest at speeds up to 175 miles per hour. On the South Col, the last stop on the route to the summit, the wind can be so cold and so strong, climbers are trapped in their tents. But every year in late May, the approaching monsoon brings a rare window of opportunity. The monsoon is such a massive weather system, effectively it, it nudges the jet stream slightly and that might displace it upwards or put a fold in it, or it might just alter the jet stream across Everest. And that means that we're then not subjected to the, the huge winds that we would otherwise experience. When the wind drops, there are weather windows. It might be 
anything from a 12 hour window to a four, five, six, even an 11 or 12 day window, where you're looking for benign conditions where we can then operate safely on the mountain. For decades, climbers had little idea when a weather window would open. Now, most climbers only summit during weather windows. One of the great things that we've got nowadays is the, the weather forecasting that comes in and it's getting more and more accurate. When a weather window does open, hundreds of climbers converge on the summit. People are opting for that optimum day, so you do get this problem of overcrowding. You're moving fairly slowly anyway, and if you're in a queue, and so you are moving even slower, and the oxygen is still flowing, your life is basically being jeopardized and you could find yourself very high on the mountain, becoming extremely exhausted and hypoxic, which is lack of oxygen to the brain, and you could die as a result. 2019 was one of the deadliest years in Mount Everest's history. 11 people lost their lives. Many of the deaths on Everest occur uh, high, particularly high on the southeast ridge. When climbers have to wait in queues, they risk running short of oxygen and may not have enough left for the journey down. You do have that problem of being somewhere where, as human beings, we're not naturally supposed to be without artificial support of oxygen and people die. I think the overcrowding has made Mount Everest actually more dangerous than it was before. How might that be resolved? Could there be a code of conduct? Um, or even if there should be a rescue service on Everest, which is anathema to the traditional mountaineering way of thinking that you know, you're self-supporting and the last thing you'd want to do is get on a mobile and ask for help. I think something has to be done to try and regulate uh, this, otherwise people are just lambs to the slaughter. Mount Everest's epic tale from tragedy to triumph has come full circle. In this program, we've discovered how brave pioneers died because they lacked the scientific knowledge to climb the mountain. But by the 1950s, mountaineering had evolved. Climbers had learned how to breathe, how to stay warm, and how to find a safe way to the top. I think Mount Everest is an incredible symbol of human progress. In a hundred years, we discovered where it was, how high it was, what to climb it with, the clothing, the oxygen, everything. By the end of the 1980s, just 284 people had stood on the summit. Now, over the last decade, nearly 4,000 climbers have made it to the top. And it has become now so simple that a 13-year-old boy can climb Mount Everest. It's more accessible, that's not a bad thing. More people will have the opportunity to climb it, that's not a bad thing. But it is a very, very different experience. We can never turn back the wheel. Now, from natural disasters to overcrowding, Mount Everest is still one of the most inhospitable, daunting and dangerous places on the planet. But the mountain will always stand proud, a breathtaking symbol of our spirit of adventure, our need to explore, and our desire to conquer. Mount Everest hasn't changed itself. It's still the highest mountain in the world. It's a still a, a beautiful wilderness. Now people just pour up it in hundreds, but essentially itself, it's indifferent to humanity. It's still the same mountain.